you so very much for tuning in here today at Church on the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusOfTheRock.org. There you can find out all sorts of information on our ministries, or you can give to our church financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us, and welcome to Church on the Rock. I'm going to be kind of brief this morning for several reasons. One, I knew we had baptism this morning, and number two, I'm physically kind of hitting on about half cylinders. I'm fighting either allergies or sinus or head cold or something, so I'm dealing with a little sore throat, and so probably won't be long. And and also, it's just not going to take a long time to share what I want to share with you this morning. Um, if you're new to Church on the Rock or if you're... Uh, haven't been here in a while, and you're back. Um, we just want to say welcome to you, and it's a good day for you to be here because we're going to, I heard, was listening to that song a while ago. It says, it's who I am, it's who I am, and it's, it's who you are, and it's who you are. That's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about who he is and who we are and how that relationship really uh, intertwines. Uh, someone said that Christianity is not so much about learning to live inside the lines. But true Christianity and true relationships about learning the joy of coloring. Or maybe just remembering the joy of coloring. You know, I'm noticing a lot of adult coloring stuff coming out now. They have, you know, you can color online and you have adult coloring books and Sometimes it just reminds us of the joy of coloring. And you take a kid and you give him a coloring book and some colors, and man, he'd just be all over the page and everything else, and it's sloppy. And, but they're having so much fun. It's just the joy of coloring. And sometimes in life, how many know we don't always stay between the lines? Sometimes we're way, sometimes I'm off the page, way out, but just enjoying the coloring, enjoying life in Christ. If you have your Bibles and you want to read with us this morning, I'm going to read two passages of Scripture, the first out of Nehemiah chapter 8, and uh, if you don't know where Nehemiah is, just follow the screen up here. It says in uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, and Nehemiah continued, go and celebrate with a feast of rich food and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Don't be sad. Don't walk around dejected and depressed. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He says, get some rich food and sweet drinks. I like this already. Get some cheesecake and pork chops and some, some sweet drink and sh share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. You already heard this morning. We fed 97 people here yesterday. And we had people, no doubt, that make six-figure incomes, and we had people who live in the woods. And we all came together, and we shared together, and we fed all of these people. We had the Gideons come over and met with us yesterday and so had just a great, great time in the Lord. What great fellowship that was. Eat a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks. Share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before the Lord. Don't be dejected and sad. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Some of you say, I just don't feel like I have any strength. Get happy. Get happy. That's where our strength comes from, our joy in the Lord. Now turn to the Psalms, chapter 103, if you're following in your Bible, <clears throat> sorry, Psalm 103, and I'm going to read beginning with verse 1. Just listen to the psalmist 
as he just rejoices. He says, basically he's saying, this is who you are. This is who you are. He says, let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins. He heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He reveals his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. He's slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He'll not constantly accuse us or remain angry. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heaven above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows, listen to this, he knows how weak we are. He remembers we're only dust. He knows that. You can't stay in the lines. You're just dirt. You're glorified dirt. I know who you are. I know how weak you are. He knows how weak we are. He remembers we're only dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers that bloom and die. The wind blows and we're gone as though we had never been here. But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. Wow. He knows how weak we are. He remembers that we're only dust. How many remember the little Peanuts cartoon with Lucy and Charlie Brown? And you remember Lucy's little psych psychologist stand? We got, yeah, psychiatric help, five cents. Lucy would fix you up, give you her words of wisdom. We got folks now that'll give you advice for free. They won't even charge you a nickel, right? Everybody wants to give you advice. But Lucy was the sidewalk psychologist. And so Charlie Brown comes by one day and he's looking for advice. He's looking for counsel. And Lucy says to Charlie Brown, she said, Charlie Brown, there are two types of people on the cruise ship of life. There are those who set their deck chair on the bow so they can see where they're going. And there are others who set their deck chair on the stern so they can see where they've been. Now, Charlie Brown, where do you set your deck chair? And Charlie Brown kind of bowed his head and confessed, I can't even get my deck chair open. <laughs> now, me and Charlie Brown's kind of shipmates when it comes to the cruise ship of life. Many times I feel like I can't even get my deck chair open, let alone put it on the bow or the stern. While everybody else is talking doctrine and theology and, and using a lot of $3 words, I'm still trying to get my deck chair open. You got folks who's talking about the Greek and the Hebrew, and I'm still quoting the Apostle Paul where he says, I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I don't have to know where you've been or what you've done or what you're involved in or what. I want to know, do you know Jesus Christ? I'm still trying to get my head wrapped around John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. 
I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my mind. I'm still quoting the psalmist when he said he remembers that we're just dust. Many times I feel like I'm a thorn in a field full of religious roses. You know, I see it. It looks like everybody, they've got their game together. They've got, but you know what? I'm convinced God's not nearly as concerned with religious roses as he is sincere seekers. People who are seeking him, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open to you. It's what Maurice was just talking about in communion. You ask, you talk to the Lord, you learn his voice. And that's what, that's what impresses God is when you have a relationship with him. Around here, and when I say around here, I mean around our community and our town and the towns around here. Church on the Rock has come to mean a lot of things to a lot of people, different things to different people. One thing that I've noticed, though, is kind of funny, is that, that we're anything but neutral. I find either some people either love us or they hate us. We're not neutral. We're not normal. We've realized that and we've accepted that. Some people love that and some people hate that. Um, our motto has been for many, many, many years now, reaching the unchurched, unsaved, unconnected, and helping them to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Now, I saw a quote the other day. I thought if I could put a motto below our motto, I think it would be this. The place where the real Jesus meets the real you. The place where the real Jesus meets the real us. Can you imagine with me for a moment a place, a church, where the real Jesus meets the real us? It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who I am. It's who I am. I, I, you know, I, I love that. I preached a sermon many years ago, six, seven, eight years ago probably. We had been talking about the church in the book of Acts, the first church, the original church, and how that they all came together and they, they sold their goods and they gave to each other as they had need and they, they listened to the apostles' doctrine and God added to the church daily those who were being saved. And it was this just awesome fellowship and this awesome communion. And, and I preached a message called, What If? What if? And I said, what if we could take what's in here this Acts 2 church, and we could put it in here. What if? What would a church look like? I know we have different cultures and things, so you, you can't do exactly like that, but what if we captured that spirit of church and we could take what's in here and put it in here? And so we started doing that. We started working that as being sort of our goal and our mission. And, and we really began to, to say, you know, what are the needs of our people and how can we help meet them? And we've come together and we, we've done so many things. But about a year or two later, God began to give me a little bit different revelation on that. And I came back and I preached, what if part two? And I said, what if now we could take what's in here and take it out there? What would that look like? What would that look like having an Acts 2 church that comes together and goes out into the world and begins to share that same love and that same devotion in, with our community and with our surrounding areas? See, what, what, what if a church were to make that and keep that as the number one goal and objective and standard and absolute where the real Jesus meets the real us? What a collision. Or maybe a better word, what a marriage. What a covenant. What a union when the real Jesus meets the real us. See, this book, this book is about becoming real and transparent 
and authentic. It's, it's not about being perfect. It never was. It's not about being better than somebody else. It's about being honest and open and transparent and real before God. I can't think of anything that would transform and revolutionize a church faster than for its membership to become real. Just to become honest and authentic where suddenly it's okay to pull off our mask. We don't even have to have a mask anymore. We don't have to have a Sunday morning mask. We don't have to have Sunday morning clothes and Sunday morning talk. We just come in and we're real. It's okay. We can slip off our Superman cape, put on our glasses, and just be old Clark Kent. We could just realize we're not super Christians. We're not super spiritual. We're just people that are made out of the dust of the earth. People who love to color, even if we can't stay in the lines. People who are here. It would be good if we could identify our kryptonite and expose, because every Superman has a kryptonite, right? We all have a weakness. We all have our vices. We all have our struggles. What are the problems that most churches struggle with today? Really all organizations, but especially churches. Think about it. The real problem in the churches are things like gossip, things like judging others, accusing others, condemning others, things like pride, that's a huge one in the church, racism, that's huge in the church. What if we had the power to suddenly eliminate all of those things by simply just admitting we're all a mess? We're all this big, huge mess, and none of us have it all together. We're all broken. And the absolute hope for any of us is that Jesus is all over our brokenness. That's the only hope that any of us have. He's fully aware of all of our mess and all of our brokenness, and he loves us anyway. He still invites us to color. Now, I preached a message kind of along this line. One time I was talking about how that the, the, the church is a mess and you know and we all and I remember I had a lady after church. It was her first time there and here. And so she come she met me after church. She said, Well I want you to know I enjoyed most of your sermon, but she said, I just want to tell you, since I became a Christian, I'm not a mess anymore. My life and I and and she started telling me, you know, how good her life and I said I want to be just like you. But I got to tell you, I've been a believer over 30 years, and my life's a mess. I have daily struggles. I, have, I still have impure thoughts. I still have, I struggle with forgiveness sometimes. I still struggle with greed sometimes. sometimes I said, and on my really bad days, this was, the ba this was probably the flesh here. I said, on my really bad days, I struggle with pride and start thinking I'm more highly of myself than I ought to. And she slung around like to hit me with her purse. And the last thing I saw was high heels tapping through the park. And I don't think I've seen her again. Church, we're all a mess. Whether we want to admit that or not, doesn't matter how long we've been a believer, we're still a mess. We still get outside the lines. You know, we still struggle with, with life. We still struggle with, with issues. Mike Iaconelli wrote in his book, Messy Spirituality. He said, spirituality is not about being fixed. It's all about God being present in the mess of our unfixedness. That's what, that's what spirituality is about, realizing that God is here, even in my unfixedness, even in my brokenness, even in my weakness. He said he knows how weak we are. He remembers that we're only dust. 
What if Church on the Rock was known as a place where it's safe to go when you're broken? Now, we are. We are. That's, that's pretty much, believe it or not, we have that reputation probably more so than any church in town. But here's my dream, here's my plan, here's my goal, that we really, really, really always strive to live up to our reputation. To live up to our reputation. People know that when you're broken, it's safe to go. Who wouldn't want to go to a church like that? Well, I know some that wouldn't, but, but I can think of a lot of people who would who would love to go where there's nothing to gossip about because we're all rotten. There's, there's nothing left to gossip about. There, there's no more scandal because we're all scandalous, right? There can't be a scandal in the church. There's nothing to judge because we're all a mess. Our only claim to fame is this is where the real Jesus meets the real you. That's our only claim to fame. Would, would that set off a firestorm of controversy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Would people accuse us of being soft on sin? You better believe it. They already do. Would religious people just hate it? Yeah, with a passion. Nobody hates grace more than religion. More than religious people. Religious people hate grace. They hated it in Jesus. See, how do I know this? Because they hated it when Jesus did it. They called him a wine bibber and a glutton and a friend of sinners. That, that's what they called it. People, religion hates grace because they don't understand the meaning of the word grace. You cannot get grace by deserving it. You can't earn grace. When you've done really, really good and you get really rewarded, that's not called grace. That's called justice. You did well. You got paid. You went to work, did a good job. You got a paycheck. That's right. That's justice. It's not grace. Grace is when you laid out sick all week and your boss says, here, I'm going to pay you anyway. That's mercy. That's grace. It's undeserved. It's I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. We throw ourselves on the mercy of the court and say, I'm guilty, judge, but I'm appealing. I'm throwing myself on the mercy of the court. I'm not asking for what I deserve. I'm asking you for mercy, for grace. But religion always wants to try to earn that and say, I've been good enough. I'll grit my teeth and close my eyes and say, I think I can. I think I can. Hey, Lord, I promise if you do this, I'll do this, and I'll never do this again. And God just shakes his head. So, yes, you will. Peter, before the cock crows, you'll be denied me three times. Boy, you can't color inside the lines. You're just dirt. You're just dirt. They murdered Jesus for it, but it's okay because he's back. <laughs> he's back, and I just want to put him back in business. That's all I really want to do is give him a place to set up shop. That's all, that's all I want to do for the rest of my ministry, for the rest of my life. I want to give him a place to set up shop because he said, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. See, I just want to be the landlord. I want to be the custodian. Just take care of the facilities. But he will always be the main attraction. He will always be the entrepreneur. He will always be the, the, the counselor, the great physician, the psychologist, the CEO. He will be whatever somebody needs when they walk in these doors. That's the awesome thing about the Holy Spirit. When you walk in these doors and you need conviction, he's the convictor. When you need healing, he's the healer. When you need comfort, he's the great comforter. When you need salvation, he's the savior. Whatever people need when they walk through the door, he's there for that. Where the real Jesus meets the real us. Whatever our needs are, he's there to meet our needs. How excited are you about being a part of a church like that? I want to be that church. I desperately want to be that church where people will come from miles around, drawn to Jesus just because we're lifting him up. 
Somebody had told John yesterday that they drive through two counties every week to get to church here. Whoever you are, thank you, and we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. Because I want to be a part of a church where the real Jesus meets the real me. I don't have to dress it up and talk it up and fake it till I make it and try to impress him and impress people. I don't have time to impress anymore. Church on the Rock is a church built on misfits and broken people who are so completely loved by a perfect Savior. So here's your homework. Here's your homework for this week. Here's your assignment. Go out and find all of your screwed up friends and tell them, boy, do I have a place for you. I have got, you got to go with me because I got a place you got to go see. And let me tell you where I thought about this because I thought about this yesterday. We were, we were out here doing breakfast yesterday and I was out in front and I was cooking bacon on the griddle. And, it was, and I mean, we had two big griddles going of, of just bacon out there. And there was a guy, I don't know, maybe you're here today, I hope you are. He was sitting on the bench out here, just, just out from there, and he got on his cell phone. And he was calling his buddies or somebody. He said, you got to get down here. He said, man, this stuff smells good. He said, no, I'm sitting right here. I'm telling you, they're cooking food right here. You need to get over here. I thought, how cool is that? <laughs> Calling his buddy in the woods saying, you got to get over here. <laughs> Man, they, they're eating. I want it to just be that attractive when they're giving a service like this and they get on the phone and they said, buddy, you got to come with me next week because I'm telling you, they're saying something you need to hear. They've got something that we need. You got to get over here and get fed. I've told you for years, we're just one beggar telling another beggar where we found food. So get on your cell phones. Find your screwed up, most screwed up friends and say, you got to come with me because you need and I need what this church has to say. You need to hear this. There's a place in town where the real Jesus meets the real us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for being who you are. Again, we're so incredibly glad you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. Now, if this message blessed you in any way, let us hear about it. You can email pray at jesusoftherock.org or you can look us up on Facebook or Twitter, Church on the Rock, Pascagoula. Now, I pray that God shows you awesome ways to apply this message to your everyday life.